Periclus and Athens by A.R. Byrne, the golden age of Greece, seen through the life of our leading statesmen, and the years of crisis one, so we're part two of this. Um, but in the year of the truce with Sparta, Periclus was faced with a far graver decision, in spite of the losses and war, which only fell on young men. Athens and Piraeus were still crowded. Moreover, we must suppose that immigrants still flowed into the capital from the empire, poor men mostly, to seek their fortune, attracted by the, easily, by the easy naturalization, which had been Athens' policy since Cleisthenes. But since Periclus' own institution of payment for civil administration, especially for service on juries, citizenship had been a source, not only of pride and a modest share of power, but of direct financial advantage. There were other benefits too. For example, if you became an Athenian and then were killed in Athens wars, the state would look after your wife and children. In the circumstances, those who had the citizenship already looked with jealous eyes upon immigrants, and a strong movement grew up for restriction of the franchise. The Athenian people had in fact become even the poorest of them, a privileged minority in the empire. The antithesis of empire and democracy has never been more brutally and clearly posed. And that's similar to something being said now, is that... Uh, if, now, I think illegal immigrants should be banned from certain, you know, if they're defrauding the government to get uh, resources, but we should be able to figure out. Um, but I'm more of an open borders, but they got to obey the law here. If they come here as gangsters and stuff like that, then you up the ante a little bit. Whatever offense it would have been for a citizen, it's even worse for a non-citizen or, or a... Or immigrants, um, that sort of thing. I mean, it's got to be real offenses. Um, maybe even institute a death penalty for something that was like a five years in prison or something, or ten year in prison sort of offense. Um, well, okay, they can give rape a couple years, but um, I, I mean, real offenses that shouldn't be twenty to life for execution flat out. That you know, things become that. Um, <clears throat> I'm not articulating it too well, but um, there was much that was plausible and even true to be said for restriction. It was argued on the most obvious grounds that there were too many people in the city, in spite of thousands carried off by clerarchies or war casualties. And on a more refined level, it could be argued that the whole ancient character of Athens was in danger of being altered by the flood of immigrants. The United States. The United States have been faced by the same problem on a vaster scale within this generation. Um, and it was getting to the point where people say, oh, well, and, and nowadays it's like, without illegal immigration, it's like, come on, the big companies can pay their lawyers enough, and they should figure out a way to work without government welfare either. So many, major, not the small guys, but the big guys get welfare checks. And it's like, if you can't afford to raise the pigs and make a profit selling them to the American people or make high enough of a profit selling them to the American people, figure out a better use of your land resources, um, fruits and vegetables, and feed more people. But but this idea, oh, we need the... We need the uh, well, no, no, Americans can do jobs. Um, I mean, immigration's fine, but Amer let's not pretend that we need the immigrants to do the jobs we don't want to do. Trust me, Americans will do the jobs. You have people cleaning toilets 70 hours a week just to get into government housing, or 40 hours a week, or whatever they make them do, because they're, you know, working minimum wage. You can't afford a place to live in most places, or you can, but the two to three times the rent isn't enough. Um... 
it was a, so Americans can do some of the most grueling, disgusting work. It was a serious matter to reverse the policy of Cleisthenes. Athens' march towards the leadership of Greece had depended hitherto not only on the brilliance of her civilization and her generals, but very largely upon the sheer size of the population that could suffer such casualties year after year and still man 200 ships at a time. Also, it must have surely been clear that even before the event to a man of Periclus's intellect, that the closing of the franchise would strike a serious, if not mortal, blow to the goodwill still felt towards Athens by the masses in the empire. But if so, it was also clear to him that this was a reform, if one can use the term of such a piece of errant reaction on which Athens was bent, on which the poor citizens, the delighted supporters of Pericles's radical measures, felt at one with, and even more strongly than the conservatives who looked to Cimon. If Pericles did not propose it, someone else would. Old Cimon, he was nearing sixty by now, was in fact showing signs of coming back as a serious political rival. The fact that he, as the man whom Sparta trusted, had to be employed to make an end of a war that was leading nowhere, had done more for his prestige than anything else since Tanagra. Now, nowadays, the people in charge of such and such countries don't have as much authority to step away from wars, no matter how bad they are for the people. And we're, we're seeing that going on right now. I, I will end these wars, and it's like, they don't let you. That's half the tax money left after welfare for the rich in my country um, is the war. Also, a little paradoxically, the policy of a renewed attack on Persia, which Camon was eager to lead, was not unpopular. The Levant offered prospects of spoil and easier victories, quite unlike those of a war and against the stubborn Peloponnesians. And at Athens, it became painfully clear when peace was restored, war financed out of Delian League contributions, and it become an industry, one might almost say a vested interest. Meanwhile, it was unfortunate for Pericles that in Tol Medes, a distinguished younger general with ideas of political leadership was also coming forward. It would not do to lose the leadership of the assembly on an important issue just now. Whatever his private views, Pericles, like Almionid that he was, made his decision. He made a political bargain with Kimon. The initial steps were taken. It is said, once more through El Pinique. El Pinique? I'm not sure of the Greek, so. Whose husband, Callias? was a leading politician, Pericles would support Kimon's proposal for a new Levant campaign. And in return, Kimon would leave home affairs to Pericles. Pericles then himself proposed to the council and assembly the restriction of Athenian citizenship to persons of citizen parentage on both sides. With an absolute minimum of trouble, the law was carried. It was a faithful turning point in Athenian history. One wonders where, whether Pericles ever regretted it. Now, if you're born in this country, you're, you're born in this. Uh, if you're born in the country, you really should be given citizenship. Um, in the spring of 450, for the last time, Kimon led a Delian League fleet of 200 ships into the Levant. The first objective was Capras. Kimon landed his troops, enlisted the Greek cities as allies, and settled down to a besiege the Phoenician stronghold of Kition, the biblical Kittim. Now, is that spelled with a Q? Is that spelled with a Thet or a Tau? Um, he detached 60 ships once more to support the insurgents in Egypt, where a prince called Amorteos, was still holding out in the Fens, and there seems to have been fighting in Sicilia. 
Kilikia, Cecilia, Cecilicha. How do you say that? Against Persian land forces, too. We know all too little about these major operations, but it's clear that in spite of some tactical success, the campaign was a failure. Kition held out. With all the stubbornness of Phoenician and Jewish sieges, food ran short. Kimon himself felt sick. His fellow grand Anax Ikrates was killed in action, storming an enemy naval camp at Sicilia. Kilikia, where Mega Buxos, the conqueror of Egypt, was again methodically preparing a counterstrike. Anax Ikrates may well have ki been killed in a raid intended to interfere with buildup, but the muddled narrative of Diodorus of Sicily contains more rhetoric than information. Meanwhile, Kimon lay in his tent before Kition, sick of a fever and troubled, like Douglas in the Ballad, by omens and evil dreams. But I have dreamed a weary dream beyond the Isle of Sky. I saw a dead man win a fight, and I think... That man was I. Then the blow fell, as in the Ionian revolt fifty years before. The Persians, though outmatched at sea, managed to run troops across from Kilikia, Cilicia, probably waiting for a north wind, which would make it dangerous for Greek ships to linger off the rocky north coast, and a slow business to beat up from the south. Kimon, from his bed, gave the orders of the Greek counter-operation, breaking off the siege of Kition. His army marched across the island, while his fleet bore up to the northward route, northward round its eastern end. He seems...